You are the light of the world, family. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all those who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and, more importantly, glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 21. You have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And everyone who says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the supreme court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother. Then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and be thrown into prison. Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent. You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye commits uh, makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one of your parts of your body than to have the whole body thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. It, it was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him receive, let, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reasons of unchastity, marks or makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard it said, uh, the, or the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but should fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you, shall con for you cannot make one hair white or black. But your statement should be, yes, yes. Or no, no, anything beyond these is of, is of evil. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly father. Is perfect. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we have a lot to be thankful for, as you've already mentioned this morning. Lord, we can look at our lives, we uh, can do an honest assessment, and we can quickly realize that we don't know <laughs> everything. Uh, and the things that we think we know are oftentimes not the things that we should know. And, and we can spar ourselves down a path of just frustration and emotions when Rather, you would just have us trust in you for all things and believe that all good gifts come from you and that we should be thankful. And Lord, we just thank you for the kids' lesson this morning as a great reminder. Thank you for the Psalms also, that there is a, a way of life that we should be living uh, and, and a righteous judge who stands in judgment of those things. Lord, and even for this section of Scripture, we know that it is our call to live a sanctified life, to be holy and set apart unto you, so that uh, the world may see our good works and so that they may glorify you and not us, of course. Lord, help us to understand these truths as we dissect your word. Help us to live them out faithfully. Help us to be empowered by the Spirit, for without your Spirit, Lord, we could do none of these things. And, of course, none of them well. 
Lord, for all of the prayer requests we have in the bulletin this morning that we are missing, we just specifically pray for Israel, Lord. We just pray that you continue to watch over your people. We thank you for the promises that were given to them, that you will be faithful to accomplish with them. But Lord, we do pray for a special mercy on them and uh, for their enemies as well. Lord, let peace reign supreme uh, in the land. Uh, help the innocent, help those who are uh, overcome by circumstances and trials and afflictions in this time, Lord, to, to seek you out and to find your face and find their true Messiah. Lord, we pray for Wanda Wade and we pray for Kingdom, Kimbra and Adam McLaughlin. We pray for Peggy and her extended family. Lord, we pray for Alva Hall and, her, and his brother. Uh, Lord, we pray for Keith for his continued recovery and Jeremy's back. Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for Joanna Barrett that this cancer may be contained. And, and Lord, for so many other people who could be on this list, we pray for them asking that you watch over them real special, Lord, and give them strength, especially in these uh, hard days and uncertain times. We pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, so very quickly, uh, we just want to do a quick recap of where we've been. Uh, this is going to be very short. Uh, Matthew 5, verses 7, we started talking about the blessed verses. Remember, blessed is just a way of saying how fortunate you are or how happy you could be in the Lord Verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I just want to remind you, this is talking about your mind, the intellectual side of who you are. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is about your emotions. There's an, a proper emotional side of who we are. Yes, as a Christian, there will be times of great joy, great peace, peace that passes all understanding. But there also should be moments of mourning, mourning your own sin, mourning the sin of the world. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is talking about our actions. There's a proper way for the child of God acts under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And we talked about what we love. What are the, mo the uh, motives of the heart? What are we hungry for? Is it more in this life or is it more in the next life? And today we get into blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. We talked about this uh, in brief last week, and today I want to kind of expand on that. I am running you through an acronym, so hopefully it's helping you to remember. Uh, the, the acronym ha so far is saying meal, and meal brought us to verse 6 when we talk about hungering and thirst for righteousness. This week, however, I want to add an, an odd letter. Maybe you, uh, in your own time, maybe think about what I am trying to say through this acronym, but this week we add the letter I. And today I want to talk about the individual story of your life. I want to talk about the essence of who you are. The essence of who you are. I was given a short little testimony this morning. I hope, brother, that you'll forgive me for using this as an example, but it was so heartwarming I couldn't help myself. Um, over the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, 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 a, a brother told me this morning that uh, their son... Uh, invited his good friend to the Thanksgiving meal. And uh, the testimony of that family's life is that this son knew that he didn't even have to ask mom or dad whether or not he could come to the Thanksgiving meal. They just knew that mom and dad would accept their hospitality, that, that it didn't matter if they brought one or four, all would be welcome around their Thanksgiving table. It's heartwarming in the sense that those kids know the essence of who their family is, the essence of who they are as people. And that will be the focus for us today. What is the essence of who we are as individuals? A couple of things for you to think about as just a way of uh, turning to some scripture immediately to get this thing rolling in your head. Go to Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 1. Let me offer you a quick verse there. Because we've been talking about our life and our conduct in this life, thinking back uh, a verse where it talks about uh, in verse 6, blessed are those in, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. What is the motive of your life? Here in Proverbs chapter 22, the wise preacher says, a good name is to be more desired than great wealth, and favor is better than rich or than uh, silver and gold. Um, the rich and the poor have a common bond. The Lord is the maker of them all. But a great name is to be desired more than great wealth. To, 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 to have a great name uh, could be a, a descriptor of the essence of who you are. To be, to be well known and, and to be admired uh, for, for who you are as a person uh, uh, I think resonates well with Matthew 5 in the sense that 
people should see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. If you go over just a, a book or two to the right, um, we go to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 says, A good name is better than a good ointment, and the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. I'll have you contemplate that. But in reality, um, what will be said on the day of our death? Um, how will people remember you? And more importantly, how will your life echo into all of eternity? What is the essence of who you are? And so Matthew chapter 5 then, going back there and looking at verse 16, for example, says, Let your light shine before men in such a way, in such a way, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Hopefully you're not doing good works to be seen by men. We've talked about that in past weeks. Hopefully men will see your good works and, and understand what drives you. What drives me is Jesus Christ to do what I do. What drives me is his call on my life to have the very essence of his son, to be like him in every possible way, and that drives me to be a light or to be an example or to be a comfort to you uh, even in this moment. Maybe that's something that you would say to somebody that you love. Likewise, I want to begin as I did last week with talking about the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we find this in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. And I'd like for you to again say it with me. Verse 9 says, Pray in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Again, the reason why I'm calling you to this is because we're talking about mercy there in verse 12, forgiving us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Remember, if you want to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then what you are asking for is forgiveness. You need to repent of your sins and be humble about the sins that you've committed in your life and ask for his grace, ask for his mercy to come into your life. And likewise, the proper response then for you is to also offer that same grace and mercy to your neighbor. That's why the verse goes on in verse 14 with a very hard command, if you will. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive you your transgressions. And what we primarily talked about last week was the first of many practical truths about mer mercy. The first and most important one being is whether or not you are a true believer in Jesus Christ. If you are truly a believer in Jesus Christ, and it should impact your life in a great way. And it should uh, usher into your life a, a sense of security about your future inheritance, about where you will spend eternity. If you are acting like your father, if you are acting in merciful ways, then you can be assured of your eternal security as one example. Scripture teaches that a life that forgives others as they themselves have been forgiven others you have that eternal security with God. By contrast, on the great day of account of our lives, if you are found without mercy, my challenge to you last week was, you may not enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I'm not preaching a work-based salvation. I'm not saying that um, if you have compassion or if you have mercy, that you can earn your way to heaven. That's not what I'm trying to say. But if you know Jesus Christ is your personal Savior, then you must show mercy. A failure to show mercy is really a, a failure in your heart to, to really, by faith, accept the commandments of your Lord and Savior and fulfill them uh, and be obedient to his will. What then is mercy, as we talked about last week? Uh, Strong's concordance would tell us that it's all about pity. It's all about compassion. And compassion is a word that we maybe better understand than pity. But last week I took you through these simple truths. Compassion is the work that God requires. Compassion is the proof that you are indeed a true believer. Compassion will enable you to forgive. And compassion will open up the doors of heaven to you 
when you live by your faith in Jesus Christ. Again, compassion alone will not save you, but compassion, or a lack of compassion, if you want to say it this way, could send you to hell. All right? I know that's a tough statement, but if you have any questions about that, I'd encourage you to look at last week's sermon, because we need to move forward. And as we left last week's tough sermon, an emotional sermon, a sermon that I tried to preach to the best of my ability, I can just imagine that we all left here saying, got it, got it, I should show compassion and I should show mercy, I got it, I, I understand that. And perhaps we left church and we got into our cars. And even on the way home, when faced with reality, we realize <laughs> mercy is easier said than done. You ever felt that way? Mercy is a lot easier said than done. Thanks to our sinful heart for uh, even public display of criticism on TV or social media, etc. Many of us Christians have developed a wicked habit of being critical and not showing mercy. We slander our neighbors. We gossip. We talk bad about other people. We join the ranks of sinful society and sinful world all around us by being like them rather than being like our Heavenly Father. In a blink of an eye, we are no longer <laughs> compassionate, just like that. Take, for example, Matthew chapter 7, uh, verses 1 through 12. I won't read all of this to you because we already read it last week. Um, actually, I'm going to read it. I think it's good. This is talking about judging others. <clears throat> I actually can't remember if I read it to you last week or not. So let's read it. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, it says, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the same way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, and behold, there's a log in your own eye, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you can see clearly the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Verse 7, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give you uh, what is good to those who ask him? In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law of and the prophets. And it's that verse 12 that I would like for you to think about as we try to move through this. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. And let's face it, we often uh, compare ourselves to other people. That, uh, well, we're good at that. And Facebook, for example, not to continue to pick on social media, is a great way to compare your life to somebody else's life. Okay. And quite honestly, how uh, we, we, we can struggle with that. We can struggle with comparing ourselves to other people. We say to ourselves, we are full of compassion, but no one else I know is. <laughs> we look down our nose at the people in our lives and we judge them for their lack of compassion, failing to realize, of course, that by judging them, we too have abandoned compassion. How soon we forget that just last week, we, for example, behaved in such a way in which someone had to be compassionate to us. Someone had to give us a small amount of mercy due to our difficult circumstances that cause us to act in a way less than the Christian ethic that we should be displaying. Just because we have a moment of compassion for other people it doesn't uh, mean that we can now climb the ladder of self-righteousness and look down our noses at everybody else who's failing to act in a compassionate way. In doing so, you prove yourself to be without compassion. <laughs> I mean, I hope you realize that. Having a life of compassion or being marked with pity or mercy 
is not a once and done thing. Again, my challenge to you this morning is being merciful should be the essence of who you are. Being compassionate should be the essence of who you are. When people think of Jesse Barrett or they think of Wayne Rowland or when they think of Keith Powers, when they think of Jeremy Porter to pick on your elders this morning, they should see their life as having an essence of mercy and compassion. Um, that is what Christ is calling us to. And I think that answer, uh, 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 to answer the question then, how do we cultivate that mercy in our lives, I think there's a, a good way that we can do this. If, if that, is the, that is the practical place where we're going, right? Like we know we need to be merciful. We know that we need to be compassionate. But how do we do it? How do we cultivate compassion and mercy into our own lives? Well, to that point, I want to give you a slide here to help you on your way. I think the first way, uh, the first individual, uh, remember I'm using that letter I uh, in, in our acronym here a moment ago, um, the individual's story. And that first individual story, that first essence, that first person that we want to look at is God's essence or God's story. Let's look at a, a, a context of who God is and what happened in the life of Israel in order for us to understand the essence of God and who he is. Go with me to Exodus chapter 31. Let's go all the way back to when the people are still wandering through the wilderness and being tested by the Lord. And uh, we see not only the essence of who the people are, but we also see the essence of who God is. I want to begin by looking at Exodus chapter 31 and verse 12. I'm in the wrong book. Hold on a minute. Exodus 31 and verse 12. Here, uh, if you uh, think about where these people are, uh, they are very near to the Mount Sinai. They are getting the law for the first time. God is starting to explain things to these people and how they should live their life. Here we get this example, this commandment given to this people at this time to do certain things and do life in a certain way. In Exodus chapter 31, beginning verse 12, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, But as for you... Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, You shall sur surely observe my Sabbath, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Now, I just want you to think about that verse very quickly. God offered, or God gave us a command to worship on the Sabbath. He offers it as a sign between me and you. or between you and God. But it's a sign that will last from generation to generation. It's a physical presence of where you are and how you spend your week that really becomes the essence, if you will, of who you are. On this day, I worship the Lord. And for the people, that is what characterized them as different. That is what set them apart from the rest of the world. God said, there is a day that you should rest. Rest. <laughs> Be thankful. Spend the day in worship and being thankful for all of the things that I have given you. It will sanctify you. It will set you apart. Verse 14, therefore you are to observe the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does, not, or for whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off among his people. For six days, Days work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall surely be put to death. And of course, a lot of this is wrapped up into a specific context of this people when you get into these things of being put to death or not. So then the sons of Israel shall observe the Sabbath to celebrate the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, but on the seventh day he ceased from labor and he was refreshed. And when he had finished speaking with him upon Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the tablets on the testimony uh, of stone 
written by the very finger of God. So God begins to describe the laws and he gives Moses the Ten Commandments. Looking at verse 1 of chapter 32 then, in verses 1 through 14, I want to share what happened next in the context of the life of Israel. It says, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, this man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in your ears and uh, of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off their gold wings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned with it a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Therefore shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt sacrifices and offered peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down at once, for your people whom you have brought up to the land forever have corrupted themselves. They have quickly quickly turned aside from the way in which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped and made a sacrifice to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Then Moses said, I have seen this people, and behold, they are obstinate. They are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone. Imagine God saying, Moses, this people is obstinate. Let me alone, that my anger may burn against them and I may destroy them, and I will make you, Moses, a great nation. Verse 11, then Moses entreated, had compassion, pitied the people, the Lord, uh, his God, and said, O Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, with evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and destroy them from face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and all the land which I have spoken, I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Then Moses turned. Uh, Let me just stop right there at verse 14. The point here is that the people sin greatly by making a golden calf. I think you all understand that. And likewise, God's intention is to bring judgment immediately, but he changed his mind, okay? Remember that. Now, skip down with me to Exodus chapter 33 and look at, look at verses 1 through 3 with me. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up, from the land of Egypt to the land I which I swore to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, to your descendants I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Go up to a land of flowing with milk and honey. Think about this again in verse 3. This is important. For I will not go up in your midst. You ever catch that before? God is going to fulfill his promise to the nation of Israel but he's going to send an angel rather than himself before the people because God is still not dealing with this obstinate people, okay? He is going to send an angel, but he's not going to go with them, okay? And that's, that's, a, that's a powerful thing to think of. Verse 3, go up to a land of flowing of milk and, hoving, milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst because you are an obstinate people and I might destroy you on the way. Wow, yeah, for sure, because he is a righteous God. Exodus chapter 4, verse 16, now listen to what Moses says and asks of God, verse 4, when the people heard this sad word, they went into mourning. God's people went into mourning because the Lord wasn't with them. And none of them put on his ornaments. They didn't decorate themselves with fancy jewelry and all the rest of it. For the Lord had said to Moses, say to the sons of Israel, you are an obstinate people, Should I go up in your midst for one moment? I would destroy you. Now, therefore, put off your ornaments from you that I may know what I shall do with you. So the sons of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp a good distance from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go up 
uh, to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. And it came about whenever Moses went out of the tent, then all the people would arise and stand each at the entrance of his tent and gaze after Moses until he entered the tent. Whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand on the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing on the entrance of the tent, all the people would arise and worship each at the entrance of his tent. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses, when Moses returned to the camp, his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Verse 12, Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you yourself have not let me know whom you will send with me. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name, and you also have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you, so that I may find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this is nation is your people. And he said, my presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is not by your going with us so that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth? Think about that, okay? Moses intercedes for the people. He, he is displaying godly compassion and godly pity for his people. And he has a very specific request. Lord, you must go with us. You must be with us all the way into the promised land because your presence, you being here with us, is what makes us distinct as a people. That's what makes us special. That makes us who, who we are. Verse 17 the Lord said to Moses, speaking out of compassion, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken. For you, Moses, have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. Remember that. I have known you by name. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. Then the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me and you shall stand there on the rock. And it will come about while my glory is passing by that I will put you on the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not see. Neither do I. I don't have an answer for you, brother. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a paradox here in Scripture, and, and we see them sometimes in Scripture, in which we just need to take it by faith. You know, does face-to-face -face mean a metaphor? Like, I, I speak to him, even though he doesn't see my face, maybe. I speak to him as a person. But in this specific case, when he's looking for to see God's glory as a whole, there's a part of God being a secret keeper that he holds back. So however you want to interpret that, uh, you're just going to have to take it by faith that that's the way it is. Yeah. When you look at uh, that verse, though, um, uh, Exodus 33, 17, uh, God knows Moses' individual story. God knows Moses by his name. And therefore, he continues to go with his people. Very quickly, just leave your finger here in Exodus and go back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 7. There is this verse here that we often think about and it terrifies us to know when, perhaps. But there is this, there is this statement here under the, the, the heading of the chapter about judging others and about prayer and the golden rule, about the narrow and the wide gates, about a tree and its fruit, about... The two foundations, we get down to verses uh, 21 through 23 of Matthew chapter 7, and it says, 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do not prophesy in your name. In your name cast out demons, in your name perform many miracles, and then I will declare to them what? I never knew you. There is a special knowing here that is transferred all the way from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And I think it's important for us to really contemplate that and understand that. That, yes, God knows you, <laughs> okay, um, but uh, does he know the essence of who you are? Is, does the essence of who you are line up to his perfect, compassionate will in your life? Or as that chapter in Matthew finishes by saying, or are you a worker of wickedness? Okay, is that the essence of who you really are? You, you know what God commands. You, you know that he asks for compassion or for mercy or for whatever his will may be. Are you that? Is that the essence of who you are? Or are you known by? God as a worker of wickedness. Here Moses has a special place in God's family in the sense that God knew Moses by name and, and, and Moses carries the same compassionate pity as God himself says about himself. And so let me just finish that by going to chapter 34, beginning verse 1. It says, Now the Lord said to Moses, Cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were written on the former tablets which you shattered. So be ready by morning and uh, come up uh, in the morning to the Mount Sinai to present yourself there to me on top of the mountain. No man is to come up with you nor let any man uh, be, be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and the herds may not graze in, your, in the front of that mountain. So we cut out two stone tablets like the former ones and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and he took two stone tablets in his hand. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, this is important, this is the essence of who your God is. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the grandchildren, to the third and fourth generations. That is who God says he is. That is the essence of who he is. And we need to understand the essence of God in that way. In verse 8, the text goes on to say, And Moses made haste, <laughs> to bow down toward the earth and worship. It's the same thing that we will do when that name of God is proclaimed someday. We will make haste to get as low as possible on the ground. Verse 9, he said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go along in our midst, even though the people are so obstinate, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your possession. Okay, so Moses is still pleading that this good God, compassionate and kind and full of loving kindness, would take for himself an obstinate people for his own possession. Verse 10, the Lord God said, Behold, I am going to make a covenant. Before all your people I will perform miracles which have not been produced in all the earth nor among any of the nations and all the people among you whom you live will see the working of the Lord for it is a fearful thing that I'm going to perform in you. All right, and then he goes on to describe what he is going to do from there. But God does go with them. Um, I can't, I'm not going to take the time to go through all of that, but God asks to, or Moses asks to see God's glory. God's essence is described in chapters 34, 6, and 7 as plain a day. And by this text, here's the point, we understand of we understand who God is. God knows, family, who we are. <laughs> we are sinners. Just like God knew who the nation of Israel was. They were sinners. They were obstinate, as we are obstinate. They are stubborn in the way that we are stubborn. 
They make mistakes all the time the way we may make mistakes all the time. And yet Moses, the essence of Moses' life, the essence of who he was, he is asking to pardon their iniquity, pardon their sin, take this wicked and obstinate people for themselves, not because they deserve it, but because of the essence of who God is. If you are all of these things, Lord, if you are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands and who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, take us. <laughs> take us. Take this people for yourself. And God does. Okay? Next week, we'll get into the context more of who the people were. All right? Uh, and, and again, I guess I've already said it. It's repeated here in verse 9, though, just as we close. By contrast to who God is and, and what his essence is, Exodus 34 and verse 9 talks about our essence without our Lord, if you will, or hopefully uh, humble enough to admit that we still live in sin and have sin in our lives despite knowing the Lord many days. Exodus chapter 34 and verse 9, and he said, If now I found favor in your sight, O Lord, please let the Lord go in the midst of us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for your inheritance. Family, we'll get into uh, the other two points as we go along with this um, verse. It's funny, I was telling my wife this week, um, we might actually be done five minutes before 12 this week, and here it is, 10 minutes after 12, as normally is the case, and I still didn't get through all the sermon here. But I, but I hope and pray that you'll come back next week. We'll talk about these two other individuals that we need to focus on. One, of course, that you, we need to focus on is God and who he is and the essence of who he is. There are two other individuals that I'm asking you to also focus on, and we'll talk about those in the coming weeks. But if you're here this morning and uh, you just feel lost, maybe if you're here this morning and you just, you just know that uh, you could be characterized as an obstinate people or, or an obstinate person or a wicked person, that you feel the conviction moving on your heart, praise God for that, okay? Embrace that. Embrace the fact that you have sin in your life. Embrace the fact that you need a Savior and beg and plead and implore the Lord who is full of loving kindness to take you as his own. This is the way it was done all the way back in the beginning. This is the way it's still done today. We're not denying the fact that, we're, that we're, we aren't wicked or obstinate. We are, okay? But it's, but it's the essence of who God is to absorb this wicked and obstinate people into himself and into his loving kindness if we just call by faith for his mercy and for his grace into our lives. We need to accept the work of Jesus Christ on the cross was sufficient and enough to pay for our sins. Yes, sir. There you go. All right. Appreciate that. Well, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for being full of loving kindness. And Lord, we admit, uh, even in this moment, that we are often obstinate. We are often dragging our feet. We're often not compassionate. We're often uh, critical, not only of you, but also of other people in our lives. Lord, uh, forgive us and help us to walk more and more with you. Help us to be more like you and less like the world each and every day. Lord, for anybody who has a need to accept you as a personal Savior, Lord, I pray that they would do this in this hour. And it can be just as simple as saying, Lord, I need you. Lord, convict that person of that heart attitude this morning. Help them to embrace you, for you are so loving and kind to us. We pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen.